Hello, everyone. You are watching live here on Facebook Live. We are here in regards to Arisen Strength and Motivational Podcast. It is great to see you. Folks, we do this show because we feel there are far too many dreams, talents, and capabilities that are being suppressed for whatever reason. Whether it be injury, illness, or life experiences, these are all situations that have us feel robbed of what it is that makes us special and unique in this world, and that's our passions. Here at Arisen Strength, we encourage people to pursue their passions in spite of the challenges they face. Now, how we do that is, is with our three pillar concepts. Number one, we support. Number two, we empower. And after all that work, number three, we have the right to celebrate. Folks, that's the Arisen Strength concept. Our goal is to help you be more than the challenges you face. Now, tonight I am without my co-host and I'm feeling a little bit, uh, I don't know, I'm the minority here. <laughs> um, but anyway, so thanks a lot, Wayne. Wayne the Hack Hacker, he will be with us again this season. Promise he is doing some miraculous things as you all know, and you have seen on his Facebook post and Instagram and all that fun. But we are here with talking about EDS wellness, as well as a number of other things with my good friend, Kendra Nielsen Miles. And I actually had Kendra on Arisen Strength not that long ago, it was in November, I believe, uh, where we did hashtag November. That's right, it was for the International Pain Foundation, our good friends of Ken and Barbie with the International Pain Foundation and Kendra was a great guest at that time. So Kendra came to me and she said, listen, you know, I know that mental health is part of, you know, the awareness month of May, but you know what? There's also something else that's also awareness month of May. And that happens to be Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I said, really? I said, well, I don't want to miss out on that. So here we are tonight <laughs> with Kendra and a few of her friends or more than a few. And uh, we're going to be talking about what Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are. But before I get started, let me go ahead and have the panel introduce themselves to you. And in the meantime, I'm going to do a few things here because we've had a few little, we've had to use our risen strength this evening as uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we are rocking and rolling now. So let's go ahead and start with you, Megan. Okay. Um, hi, I'm uh, Megan Karenfill. I am a patient advocate and medical researcher. Am I just introducing myself or do you want to get yeah. through and tell my story now? No, just go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll go tell our stories. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have been um, a patient since I was 26, um, officially, but I have been um, suffering this my whole life and I have gotten my medical degrees to try to help others and I'm here to try to share my story. Awesome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, Stephanie, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, I'm Stephanie Gadel. I am 27 years old. I live in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I actually got my undergraduate degree in political science and so my background is a little bit more in advocacy. Um, so my diagnosis actually kind of changed everything for me. Obviously, I think everyone here can probably attest to that. Um, but when I got diagnosed, I kind of decided like, I'm going to make this something else and I'm going to use it to advocate for myself. And then I'm going to take that advocacy and use it to advocate for other people. And so um, I work with EDS Wisconsin out of the state of Wisconsin and I blog a lot for them. Um, they kind of stumbled on me because I was already using my personal social media to tell my story. And now more than anything, I just use every opportunity I can to share everything I can and really hope that other patients get diagnosed when they're younger than I was, because I've only been diagnosed for two years. So, Virginia, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Virginia Phillips. I am 44. I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, although I was born in Wisconsin. So I have this uh, oh, yay. for Wisconsin. I'm there often. I was diagnosed with EDS about 18 months ago, and I professionally do a business coaching. I really work with entrepreneurs and, and move them forward in, in their dreams, but that, that whole part of my life really came about when EDS spiked and I needed to work on my, my own. Before that, I really worked in a, in a high-stress corporate job that I loved and never thought I'd have to leave, but EDS kind of had some different plans for me. And 
I believe that I can call myself uh, an EDS patient advocate, although I really work with a, a comorbid disease with EDS called mast cell activation syndrome. I got into that because I really felt like that was more of my issue at the time than EDS was. That's a bit of my story. Well, thank you for sharing. Thanks for being here. Melissa? Hi, my name is Melissa. Um, I run a website called EDS Needs, and I just launched a, a pain journal, essentially, this month in honor of EDS Awareness Month as well. Um, I have been a patient my whole life, but, you know, I, I really wasn't getting anywhere. I, I sought help at 15 and I was kind of dismissed and brushed aside like many of us are and I didn't get diagnosed until 19 years later and I actually really had to push for my diagnosis and honestly it's been three years since my diagnosis but there's such a misconception not only among patients but and doctors that I've really struggled which is what I guess kind of birthed this project this journal and honestly so that, it's been three years since my diagnosis but there's such getting feedback, sorry. So that, uh, you know, I guess I ended up turning into a patient advocate when I was really just a frustrated patient myself. Um, and I really just, I don't want people to endure the same things that I did. And, and like Stephanie, I believe was saying, mm -hmm. you know, if we can help get people diagnosed younger, we can avoid a lot of issues that we end up manifesting over the years from not being treated. Yeah, and I we met on Instagram. Yes. Yeah which is wonderful. I love all my friends. I don't like many of them. Um, I guess I should introduce myself, Shane. What do yeah, you think? Uh, I, I am uh, Kendra Nielsen-Miles. I am the executive director and founder of EDS Wellness. I was diagnosed, God, I'm 39, almost 30. So I was diagnosed at 25, 26, uh, after the birth of my first son. So I've been, and I've been involved in the community ever since. So I've been involved in the community for almost 14 years, guess, in doing different things. My background is public health. I am a certified health education specialist. I also recently uh, passed the board certified patient advocacy exam, which is also kind of underneath anyway, part of public health. Um, I'm a yoga instructor. My vision and mission has always been uh, movement, nutrition, lifestyle, medicine, if you will, because even if you don't have a doctor, I feel very strongly that we can help ourselves in some way, even just a little bit. Um, and there was a lot of misinformation out there. I've done a lot of volunteering, um, founding EDS One, a lot of projects with the providers, conferences, well, blues conferences. I've done a lot um, over the years, published, you know, books, um, different things. But my whole goal was to always, just like everybody said, to help them get diagnosed younger, but also give them hope. Because we can have a diagnosis, but if there's no hope, there, was a, there wasn't a lot of hope. You know, even if we get a diagnosis, there, there was a lot of stories that people didn't understand or even know that we're hopeful that people can not necessarily get better. You're not going to get a cure, but you can get better, but get out of the spiral, as I say. Um, and how I do it is different than everybody else, but um, there was just not a lot of hope. It was very sad. And I wanted to share those stories of hope to give people strength and to not just raise awareness and education and get them diagnosed earlier, but also to help them understand that there is a way to live well. How I do it is different than everybody else, but I'm helpful and willing and want to help you walk that journey with you. So that's why we're here. All right. Well, Arisa Strength is all about inspiration through awareness and motivation. So obviously we're getting a lot of awareness here tonight. And of course, we're going to utilize the pillars and foundations. The majority of people don't realize that they actually use the foundations uh, very, very often when they're in their advocacy or when they're dealing with their certain challenges and struggles in life. You know, the, the foundations are, number one, you need to take ownership, right? You need to take ownership of your own recovery. Number two, have the power of turning the thought. That is very powerful to do. To have the power of turning the thought, you really can make things happen. And number three is the freedom of acceptance. And that's something that I know I've utilized numerous times with the different things that I've dealt with. Kendra knows that I deal with a number of different mental health issues. I deal with uh, chronic nerve pain. I, I, I have a neck injury that has stemmed into chronic nerve pain that I've dealt with for now far too long. Um, but it might be something that I might be dealing with for longer. I don't know. Um, that's something that a lot of you are going through the same deal. You have a diagnosis and there is no current cure. Um, 
And so you're kind of like in limbo a little bit. So it's kind of difficult in order to, I'm sure you find it a little bit difficult, um, you know, working your way through it sometimes. What do you think, Stephanie? You know, I, I talk about this a lot with people and I talk about when I first got diagnosed, how like for the first month I was happy. Like I was thrilled. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm not insane. And I would just tell everyone, I would go on the internet and I would read things and I would be like, yeah, this is why this happened to me. And then all of a sudden I was just really depressed. It was like almost exactly a month later. I was so depressed. And when I talked to other EDS patients, it seems like that's almost a normal cycle. And not necessarily in the same time, but a similar thing. Um, but then I made kind of like a decision. And this is always the language that I use to describe it, is that I really had two choices. It was that I could either keep living my life with this disease, right. and that meant making adjustments and learning how to live with it. Or I could stop living my life and still have this disease. Like those were really the only choices. Like it wasn't going to go away. I wasn't going to, like if I quit doing everything and sat around my house and was sad about it, it wasn't going to be any different. Like, in fact, it was going to be a lot worse. And so that was really like reality for me was I have to make a choice now, this day. And I, I get asked like, would you get rid of it? Would you not get rid of it? What would you do? And there are days where I wish more than anything I didn't have EDS. Like, more than anything, there are days where it just breaks me. But then I think about it and, like, I'm not, I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have this. I wouldn't be as strong as I am. I wouldn't be able to speak the way that I do. And I wouldn't be able to tell people what I need the way that I do. I mean, I do work for other people, like, not even related to chronic illness, just in my community. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would have the ability to do that if I hadn't felt for so many years like I wasn't hurt. You know, and I, I think that that's really important. I, I think we don't necessarily realize, you know, what we're doing when we're doing it. But I, 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 we're not out here trying to be inspirations for people. You know, that's the other thing. I hear, oh, you're an inspiration. Oh. No, like I just want to live my life. And I want to do Get married. things I want to do. And I might have to do them differently. Yeah. Yep. And I might have to do them differently. Like, I can't walk every day. Sometimes I need a walker. And sometimes I need a cane. And sometimes I use crutches. But I'm still living. And I'm still doing everything that I want to do. I'm just doing it differently. And I adjusted my goals to be reasonable. But I didn't stop having goals. You know, and that was really what it was. Is like, there is no cure. And there probably won't be a cure in my lifetime. But I think Kendra really said it best when she said, like, it might not get cured, but it does get better. You know, like, even just in, like, the way that you approach it mentally is, like, some people get upset if you talk about mental health and right. EDS because they think you're implying that right, it's psych- in their head. Mm-hmm. Or, like, if you say that you might need to see a therapist when you have this kind of condition, it's because it's fake. Sure. But more than anything, it's so important to me that I'm able to talk about how much it affects you psychologically to be incurable and to be in pain right. know, all day, every single day. And just because, people don't like know what that's like until they're in it. No. And just because it does, affect that doesn't make it fake. Health, and right. it doesn't it make doesn't it less real. Fake. That's right. Absolutely. In fact, Shane, right. before we um, tell everybody else's stories, I, I think also, Megan, would you mind just giving like a brief overview of what I just realized we didn't even talk about what EDS is. Yeah. So EDS- yeah, that's true. Yeah. So Stephanie was saying all these really important things. That's so great. And I'm sitting there going, but wait a minute. We actually have to talk about what EDS is. So Megan, go to it. So Eleanor Stanlo is a group of collagen disorders. And collagen is the most abundant thing in your body next to water. So if you can imagine, basically anything and everything in our body could be messed up in, in some way or another. Um, two common things that come along with EDS are mast cell activation syndrome and autonomic dysfunction. And oftentimes those things cause more symptoms than the EDS itself. So it's not just Ehlers-Danlos that a lot of us suffer with. It's the ability to not regulate our temperatures or um, not regulate uh, our bodies overreact to allergens that we are in our environment that we're not actually allergic (laughs) to, but our bodies mount these immune responses against them. Um, Ehlers-Danlos itself often causes dislocations and um, joint problems, joint pain, um, but sometimes 
the, the line is clear between the other panels, the mass cell oxidation, the dysautonomia, the neuropathy, or whatever else that the collagen being faulty has caused in our bodies. Right. And it's important to also note that in connective tissue, there are different types of connective tissue in our body, but every type of connective tissue has collagen, but there's also different types of collagen in the body and also mm -hmm. mass cells. And mass cells, as we've all talked about, are our allergies, are also our guards, our sentinels that protect our body and they're active and their their protection is, is normal and it's protective. But when it goes awry, a lot of things can happen. But mast cells and collagen, a type, whatever type of collagen, is in every single type of connective tissue in our body. So it's not just our tendons and ligaments, it's, you know, stretchy skin and it can be different things. And there are 13, now 14 different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes that are associated with hypermobility, but there's also a whole bunch of over 200 or something different hypermobility related conditions that almost share a lot of these same symptoms and issues that we're talking about. So it's important to also recognize that there are different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. There's also different types of hypermobility related disorders that look similar to EDS, um, but there are other different connective tissue disorders. So that are also associated with hypermobility and, and they that's usually genetically you can find on a genetic test, except yeah, so that's hypermobile true. EDS doesn't have a genetic mutation identified. Yeah, that's the thing I was going to mention that I should have mentioned at the beginning is, so it's a collagen disorder that our DNA doesn't properly code for collagen properly. So people say, oh, well, can't you just take collagen? Well, it's not that simple because if we take, well, first that's of all, my favorite collagen, question. it doesn't make collagen in your body, yeah. but we don't have the DNA to make collagen properly. One thing people miss, though, with that is we actually have over 20 types of collagen in our bodies, and each type of Ehlers-Danlos is unique to one mutation in one type of collagen. So if there is a way to strengthen collagen in the body, one type of collagen isn't in one type of tissue. Different types of collagen are wound together to make strength in our tissues. So if we could find a way in research to strengthen oh. one type of collagen or, or, or you know, we, we could really could be, you know, having some breakthroughs here. But unfortunately, oral collagen isn't, isn't proven to do so yet. So Is it specified to the individual as well? I mean, based off of their DNA? Because there's different, yeah, obviously, so, there's different makeups of each and every individual. Yeah, That's so. Associated with the presentation. Have, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Ahead. I have a uh, type 5 alpha 1 collagen mutation. So that means that I have classical Ehlers-Danlos and I have a substituted for a G and in um, where my genetic code is. And, and they found my mutation, so I, I know where mine is. But somebody could have a G where you're supposed to have a T in a different area. And, and it's, it, it, there's no, every, every person could have a different mutation. Several people could have, you know, a, the same mutation on a different gene or a different mutation on the same gene. And, and, and not only that, but each cell in our bodies can, um, due to mosaicism and other things, can express genes differently. So it very, every individual is so unique. And there's there's really you know a, a need to assess everybody individually for this. Just to give you an example, Shane, for every type of EDS there is, the each person doesn't present exactly the same. For vascular EDS, there's what 300 different mutations on the collagen three, you know, gene that is associated with vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and that is associated with different presentation. I mean, there's just there's even a number of different mutations on different types of collagen and you know, then there's all these other factors that can present and how each person presents. So really each person with even the same type of EDS, if even if that's found genetically, we all present very differently for many obvious reasons, environmental and different things like that too. And and this is why telling our stories and the, the earlier the diagnosis, the better, um, which, is, which is so important because there are things that can be done that can help the spiral, the EDS spiral, as I call it, either in the way that people climb out of it um, so they can prevent the damage that's permanent. There's all these different things that it's not that it's going to be a cure, but if you get 5%, then 10%, and then 5% another way, and then 5% another way, that's still 20% better than somebody had before. And if we can help with education and proper diagnosis and really an integrative approach, a lot of us can't take medications. A lot of us are super sensitive to medication. A lot of us have drug metabolism issues. So if we've really figured out that micronutrient and nutrient uh, density of our, of our tissues is important. A lot of us have 
really different and low micronutrient panels. So making sure that we have proper levels of vitamin D and vitamin D is super critical. So there's just a lot of things that seem very simple that can make a, sometimes a huge no, difference. It doesn't seem simple at all. <laughs> In fact, that's why I'm going to, I'm going to slow us down a little bit because it, it, it can be really overwhelming um, because <laughs> I can't imagine somebody who's actually dealing with it. But I can tell you that from somebody who has absolutely no idea what Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is, their head is spinning right now. So let's 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 slow down just a bit um, because I know a little bit about it, right? Because I've I've obviously worked with you in the past, so I know a little bit about it, and I knew that you know that this was something that was complicated, but yeah. it is very overwhelming when somebody's dealing with it. So let's let's kind of slow down just a bit where we are kind of thinking about those who might have just recently been diagnosed with it so as to be able to you know understand what somebody who might be going through and i mean obviously folks we've gone through a lot of information right now i mean we just went through a whole list of things that kind of fill along with this now this is not unusual you know when it comes to chronic illness the chronic illness community they're very used to having these types of things happening they're very used to having to where you know you've got more questions than what you do answers you've got more doctors than what you do answers you've got doctors who believe one thing and the other one believes another thing you've got the cdc that says well no it's not this but then you've got a doctor who says yeah but it is this it's really kind of confusing when you are in the chronic community and you are dealing with something like this now elder elder syndrome a lot of people might look at it right because it's hypermobility that might be like a benefit to somebody if they're not thinking about it right they might be thinking it out of out of the box right they may be looking at it as like something oh that's kind of cool but doesn't seem like it's painful but this falls into not only the chronic illness community it falls into the chronic pain community as well this is not something that is just like oh the, the, the skin stretches a little bit or oh they might be able to do some movement that they otherwise you wouldn't think that they'd be able to do this is something that is is some that is overwhelming and and we just proved that right in just a little bit that we've talked about virginia i know that you um when in talking to you just you know before the show that you deal with some related uh conditions as well mm -hmm. when you found out that you had those types of conditions that were and then you got involved into the eds community is this were you feeling overwhelmed like like i'm sure that a lot of people are i don't know that overwhelm is the word that i would use uh if you look at my history i was involved in a, a really bad car accident in 2012. Mm -hmm. i really wish i knew i was eds at the time because the the people on this panel are going to reassure me that when I was in this car accident, it tore me apart rather than crushed me. I did not get treated appropriately because my ligaments stretched and tore versus my bones breaking. So they didn't think I was really hurt because I didn't present like a normal patient. I wasn't wise enough at that point to understand that. So I spent the next several years trying to get treated for my injuries and and I had a really great team, but they didn't have enough pieces to put together for me. It wasn't until four and a half years after the accident that we pieced together this EDS piece of the puzzle. And at the same time, we brought forth what's called the mast cell activation syndrome. And, and that syndrome, as we've discussed, is this hyperactivity uh, to your world. You, you just, uh, you, you react to your world in a way that's overreactive like a hyper vigilant yeah it's you're just always in the fight or flight mode right. you're you know and it can be something as simple as a, a slight temperature change in the room whether it's up or down mm -hmm. uh, i used to if it was one degree i could tell the difference in my house it was cold if it was 69 if it was 70 degrees i was okay and it boggles my husband still to this day, like, how can you notice that difference? That's that hyper responsiveness to my environment that my body was doing. When I was diagnosed at the same time with hypermobility EDS and mast cell activation, it was this 
as somebody else has said on this panel, was this overwhelming like pieces to the puzzle that finally made sense. And I could go back to my entire life and all of those diagnoses that they, they couldn't put an official diagnosis for, now I have it. Now I understand why I was so sick as a kid. Now I understand why my knees hurt so bad in high school. You know, they were so loose in high school. All of these pieces began to put together and I felt like for the first time my life made sense to me. I was so thrilled with this that I immediately turned around and started doing some advocacy because I thought if it was this much of a game changer for me. Somebody else out there is suffering like I am. And if I can share the two cents that I have with them and make them put two bits together and put a big puzzle piece in their life in place, I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, so I never really had the sense of overwhelm. I had a sense of true relief and a sense of understanding and a sense of listening and a direction to move forward to really gain quality of life back. So in a way you felt validated. You felt validated <laughs> for what it is that you were going through. Absolutely. Okay, all right, I get that. Melissa, when you were first diagnosed, what was that like? Well, you know, when I was first diagnosed, um, I had had my son two years prior and it really seemed like after the birth of my son, just my symptoms exploded. Like I had dealt with pain for as long as I can remember. I, I, I still do on a daily basis, but it just, I was having so many extra issues and I was so depressed for so long because I couldn't get off the couch. When you I had said, it. I, I apologize. When you said that as for as long as you remember, are you talking about in your childhood years? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I had already been going through this entire depression and depressed phase and I was doing research um, because I was I was really honestly just tired of watching my son grow up and not being able to interact on a level that I wanted to and I felt was healthy for the both of us. Mm -hmm. And I was doing research and I came across EDS and it was just light bulbs and fireworks and it was like reading your entire life story but someone else has written it and like Kendra was saying I I joined a lot of these groups for support and it was it was so sad and it was so just overwhelming the the depression and the realization that people climb into these holes and you know it's hard to get out of but when you're in the moment it's even harder and I couldn't deal with it so I kind of just turned around and I channeled my frustrations at at learning and trying to find answers and I was getting a lot of negative feedback from my physicians at the time and I, I still do in, in many ways and I was logging all these things and I was like this this has to be helpful for other people because I can't be the only person so it just kind of brainstormed into this other idea that I came out with but did I answer your question we talk a lot yeah no it, it's good no that definitely uh, answered my question Megan my question to you is, is the diagnosis hard to come by? In other words, like, do you have to end up with going through a number of doctors to be able to finally get to where that diagnosis is like, like you guys are talking about fireworks and light bulbs and everything. It's like, hey, this all makes sense now. That's how we feel. Well, I, got, I, can, I can understand it from the standpoint when I was diagnosed with PTSD. Okay, because and that was only six years ago. So I mean, I understand, and I probably have, and 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 the experiences that I've had in my lifetime, there's a number. I was pretty ignorant to think that there were. You know, I've had four broken arms. You know, I mean, I was suicidal. I had a number of different things that were going on, and that that some of my some of the attempts that I have made were were definitely traumatizing. And so for me to think, I mean, I, I actually had a stock car flip into the pits and I got hit by pieces of the motor. So I was kind of ignorant to think that, you know, maybe I might have PTSD, but I didn't even think about it. I just kept on moving on. I just kept on going through what I was going through. And that's what I did too. Right? Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden I'm at a conference table. Somebody's uh, reading the, you know, the DSM-5 and they're, you know, going through the symptoms of what, PTSD is and I stood up literally because my my head was going bing 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 and I said what is that I go through that every single day what is that 
and they looked at me like I had three different heads, and they said that's PTSD. So it kind of sounds like this is what you guys are going through is to where like you go through the, the yeah. symptoms of all that that is all about Ehlers Danlos syndrome and it takes a while for somebody to come out and say you know what I think you got Ehlers Danlos syndrome well it was like for me it was funny I have a friend we became friends in college and she actually got diagnosed with EDS before me like a couple of years before me and she knew everything that was going on with me. And she called me and she said, like, you have EDS. I know you have EDS. And I was like, <laughs> was like, you are crazy. I don't have that disease. Like, first of all, there's no way we both have this condition. Right. Like, that was my first thought was just like, it's not even like reasonable that we both have it. And then it was like, I didn't want to have it. So I told her she was nuts. And like, I repeated this and she would tell me like every few months, every time something else would happen with me, like you have EDS, you have to ask your doctor if you have EDS. And I wouldn't do it. Like I'd never asked a doctor this for years. Like she was sure that I had this condition. And then I was at like probably my 20th orthopedic specialist, like trying to get my legs fixed. Like I had four leg surgeries in high school in two years, trying to rebuild them. And they'd gotten worse and worse and worse when I was older and I was like dislocating my knees and ankles, like multiple times a day, like falling down in my own office. And so I was up at this like orthopedic doctor, like almost an hour away from where I live. And it's funny cause it was actually like a resident was working with me and he, the regular doctor, like the full time, whatever, I don't know, like only know the terms from Grey's Anatomy sort of thing. Um, he said, I can't really see anything wrong on your MRI. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I've been dealing with this, like, since I was a kid and like, it hurts so bad and I'm falling down all the time and whatever. And so he left and then I'm like alone with this resident or intern or whatever he is. And he's like, well, I think I know what's wrong with you. And he starts like messing around with my other joints. And I was like, well, don't tell me I have EDS. <laughs> and he's like, well, how do you even know what that is? And I'm like, well, I have this friend, and she said that I had it. Like, it's been like two years at this point. Wait a minute. So, so let me get it. this straight. You had surgery after surgery. You went through all this and everything, but you were in denial that you had EDS. You didn't want my, to bring it. My up. first dislocation was when I was 12, and I got diagnosed with EDS when I was 25. I was 25 too, and I, I was in the hospital at Hopkins, in and out of the hospital my entire life. That's the thing. I mean, the thing is, doctors yeah. thought that EDS is this thing that only one in a million people have, and that yeah. you know, they don't right. know what to look for. And that is the tragedy that we have to bring the awareness. Why can't medical schools be taught that, you know, it's, it's actually a really, really easy thing to check a person for EDS? Hypermobility is a very easy thing to check. You know, my arm goes like this. You know, I asked my doctor, <laughs> why does my arm go like this and why does it hurt so much? My radius that's not went normal. Up. That's, <laughs> like, that's not normal. That's the person who has my idea. So when I um, <laughs> so funny. They just said, oh, you have fibromyalgia. And I was like, all right, well, I have fibromyalgia. Let me learn everything about fibromyalgia. It's all in your head. And well, I if it's, if it's I, fibromyalgia, it's all in your head. That's what that's what everybody well, used to say. I was lucky enough to be in, you know, I, I was lucky enough to. I'm not communicating as well today as I normally can because of brain fog and. Well, we know. all have that too, so it's all good. Our brains are hypermobile too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but, but basically, I was very well spoken, and doctors didn't really think I was crazy so um, I didn't have that hurdle like a lot of other people did but I researched about fibromyalgia and I said you know what like there's more to this than that mm -hmm. I you know that's why I got my degrees in medical um, studies I you know I went to school for molecular biology and biochemistry and I learned about everything I could and I was even more confused until I learned about Ehlers-Danlos I went to the Ehlers-Danlos conference and it just all clicked for me. Um, and, and actually, this year, I'm going to be presenting at the Danlos Conference for newly diagnosed people cool. to help them with their journey. And, you know, th this is something that, you know, all of us that have this really want to give back to people that, you know, are struggling with this. And, you know, because we had, but, but how many patients don't make it to that conference? How many patients never hear the word Ehlers-Danlos? How many patients like me, I brought up Ehlers-Danlos to my doctor 
And she said, oh no, the only patient I have that with that is in a neck brace. And she, you know, you don't have that. You'd be in a wheelchair. And I was dismissed. Right. And, and I and also, like, also say that that's also part of the mission of EDS Wellness is to make sure that we can bring these things virtually on the new e-learning platform. Mar Megan's going to help me. We're going to record some things very excitingly. Hush, hush. Um, <laughs> um, but that's also like to your point, not everybody can make it to the big conference or to my Wellapalooza conferences or to whatever conferences. Sometimes all they have or they're in Ireland and all they have no doctor that they the whole point is to bring them information even if they have nothing um like because to your point shane you asked megan about like how hard is it to be diagnosed at this point and megan can answer this a little bit more in depth than i can i'll just say it's a lot better than it was but i thankfully when i was diagnosed 14 13 years ago i had a very intuitive orthopedic surgeon who i went to after i had johan and i was like why are my knees really hurting and i have arthritis in every single joint in my body and he like looked took one like move of my kneecap and he's like uh you have eds and i don't know how to diagnose you but i mean that story doesn't necessarily happen i also had a really good friend of mine who was like one of my first mom friends in our community who was a genetic counselor who worked with one of the doctors at one of the bain institutions in maryland so that story, my story, in being from the time that it was suspected to the time I was diagnosed was literally nine months. However, I had had years since I was a toddler of issues from going to Wilmer Eye Institute as a kid, all this stuff. So there were a lot of things that people should have noticed way early, but I was blessed in the way that when somebody finally kind of saw it, I was able to get, he didn't know how to diagnose me. And that's a frog behind my window. Okay. I was like, <laughs> what yeah, in the world? I was like, that's that? weird. Yeah. Left me on my office. But I was blessed, but I, it, it doesn't mean that I hadn't been to countless doctors my entire life, emergency room at Sibley Hospital, my father wondering why I slept through Europe my whole life and all these family things. Do you hear that frog? <laughs> um, you know, there was all these things. It that sounds like it's right next I, to you. I was diagnosed with, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I had horrible stomach issues, dislocated knees, chronically tired my entire life, you know, illegally blind, like all these things that there was clear signs, you know, way early that somebody could have noticed, but they didn't, you know, now I think they might, you know, especially because I didn't really gain muscle very easily and I was flexible, but, but then they didn't. So, um, but I was really lucky by the time somebody actually noticed it, it was pretty pronounced. Um, it, I was, it didn't matter. Thank, thankfully, unthankfully, whatever you want to look at it, how I looked or how fit I was, I've always worked out, didn't necessarily, wasn't indicative of what happened, what was obvious behind closed doors, thankfully right. for me. So go ahead, Megan. I, I think one of the biggest things for us too, is because it took some of us so long to get a diagnosis. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you're you're taught to trust doctors. You're taught to trust that they are the authority and that everything they say is. And when I was, you know, a teenager, I was a dancer, and I'd go in, and you know, I think my hip is dislocating. Like, you know, I and and my doctor was like, "No, your hip's your most stable joint." I'm like, "But it pops in, it pops out." You know, I was talking to them about it, and it wasn't until I was in physical therapy, like eight years later, that it popped out during a session. And I popped back in and, and everything, but you know, I had the physical therapist to verify, like, is this, is this a dislocation? You know, my doctor said it wasn't and it, said it was, and you know, it, it, doctors sometimes are, are taught to not believe unless they see it because they think patients are exaggerating or whatever. And then we trust them. But, but that doctor telling me that the years that I went walking on a partially dislocated hip caused so much damage that I feel every day now. And it does such damage to EDS patients to have doctors blow them off. And then when we have a real issue, we don't know if we can trust them. And we are supposed to be able to trust the medical community to take care of us. Um, later on, you know, years later, I had a blood clot that almost killed me because I just brushed it off as nothing because the stuff that I go through every day is so much worse than literally half of my lung being dead. I presented, I went to the ER three times. And on the third time I said, look, there is something wrong. Do this test. They're like, no, we'll just do it to, you know, appease you. And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong. And they came back and they said, I, they are like, I don't know how you're breathing right now. I don't understand how you're alive. Half of your lung is dead. I, we've never seen a patient that, that hasn't been gasping for air or not. You know, Ellers Daniels patients are often told, we've never seen somebody look okay when they have this 
thing. So we look okay a lot of the time and then we're not taken seriously because we're so used to all the pain right. and dislocations that some things that could be, you know, a nine or a 10 on somebody else's pain scale is just an everyday thing for us. Well, and I mean, if you think about even when I was diagnosed 13 years ago, right after I was diagnosed, my husband's best friend was diagnosed. And one of my very closest friends who graduated from the University of Maryland School of Public Health was also diagnosed. I remember thinking then, it's not that rare. And we all, you know, we were all, you know, worked out and athletic and, and everything. And, you know, it, it is hard. I think what, that was one of the also things that when I spoke at University of Maryland to the genetics, through the genetics department, to all the new medical students, I can't tell you how many times there are medical students that come up and be like, well, I can kind of bend my finger back like that too. And I've got a friend and, you know, it was just, you know, the wheels were turning and, and uh, my sister is actually a physician and she's in Cal California. Hi, Cynthia, if she ever watches this. Um, and I remember her sending me the screenshot of the one slide on EDS that she learned in medical school. And this was not too long ago. And so this was probably maybe five or six years, maybe probably five or six, seven years ago. So, I mean, one slide, one day in medical school on EDS. And that was my own sister. So, you know, it's, I think we've come a long way. We still have a lot more ways to go. I think this is why EDS Awareness Month is so important. Um, I would love to hear thoughts on you all on what you think about EDS Awareness Month, what we can do next year. Um, Shane, what do you think? Well, I mean, yeah, definitely we want to go in that direction. Um, with it being EDS Awareness Month, I mean, like again, we, we've got a tremendous amount of information that, that mm -hmm. somebody who might not have any clue about what Ellis Downloads Syndrome is, is, you know, kind of like, oh, this is a lot more than what it is that I would have thought it would be. But that's not unusual, like I mentioned before. Now, the thing is, is that the problem with Ellis Downloads Syndrome, just like with any other, you know, chronic illness, any other chronic pain, nerve pain, whatever the case may be, it's not just around during the awareness month you know i mean it, it, it's with us 365 days out of the year 24 7 in different ways sometimes we have some good times i mean that sometimes there's there's times just where yeah it's not you know like like megan had mentioned the the pain threshold you know yeah we can deal with an eight and we can smile you know dealing with what it is that we're dealing with where somebody who's dealing with an eight sometimes might be like on the ground because I've been there as well. I've had back a back injury and I know when it spasmed, it was like, oh my God, you know, I didn't think it was ever going to stop. Um, people who deal with back spasms and, and back injuries probably would laugh at me, you know, but, it, but because I had no idea what that was like, it was real soon, real quick. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about what are some things that you have found to be helpful for you? I, I know that, you know, like we mentioned right from the beginning, this is likely going to be a preview of what it is that we plan on doing in the near future. So we're, we're going to be talking about it more in depth. We're going to be talking about with individual stories and so forth and how to get, you know, the awareness out for these, this condition, these conditions that, you know, like you had mentioned, there's 14 of them, you know, now. Um, most people don't think about that. You know, I mean, you say fibromyalgia, it's one. You know, I mean, when, when, you, when you say, you know, lupus, it's one. You say Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, they have, they have no clue that there's 14. Well, the other thing, it, Jane, also that's important to point out is that a lot of us have these comorbid conditions and there is an overlink with these inflammatory right. autoimmune yeah. conditions. There's several of us that have, you know, RA and, and EDS, uh, you know, lupus and EDS, I know several people with lupus and EDS. Um, how, what's the statistic, Megan? Like 85% of those with fibromyalgia are hypermobile. There's been a couple of studies that actually have looked at fibromyalgia and hypermobility and the overlink with EDS too. So there's so much that we don't know exactly in research and I could be, don't quote me on exactly the number because I don't have it in front of me, but there is so much that we don't know yet because you're right, it's you know, just lupus or RA, but there's, now we're finding all these links that have those people actually been looked at for hypermobility or even a type of EDS? And lo and behold, guess what? There's a lot of overlaps. So, well, when it comes to autoimmune, don't get me going because I, it drives me nuts because it's like, it seems as if like we, we rush to a title of what this particular 
autoimmune illness is. The bottom line, in my point of view, is we need to go after the that it's an autoimmune illness. Period. You know, I mean, there's there's some there's some similarities in each autoimmune illness that yeah. that, that that's there. So. You know, and why do we have these overlaps too? Why do these people have these triggered autoimmune conditions, but then also have, you know, EDS or something? Why are there overlaps? You know, I, I think research will tell. Thank right. you. Right. Yeah. I, 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 pers I personally think that the overlaps in themselves, I think they're getting kind of, especially when it comes to science, science is slow. Okay. <laughs> science is all about, you know, process of elimination. And, uh, you know, so with that being the case, when it gets to the overlap, I think they're getting they're getting way confused with it. To be honest with you, I think that they. What do you think, Megan? I mean, you know. So there was a, there was an interesting study done a long time ago by I believe Professor Rodney Graham, which is kind of one of the biggest you know superstars in the EDS community that did a lot of research on it initially, and he tested everybody that came into a rheumatology clinic for any reason. Mm -hmm. for um, hypermobility syndrome, which would be, um, you know, doing the bait and scale of seeing how hypermobile somebody is and doing the Brighton criteria. And they found a really, really, I don't remember the statistic, I believe it was around 50%, um, but don't quote me on that, that just people that were just referred to a rheumatology clinic met this criteria. So actually last year, um, the uh, consortium came together and tried to refine this criteria a little more. Because some, it's not necessarily a, about hypermobility and pain. We don't know what causes some people to be hypermobile and have a little bit of pain and be really sick. And we don't know what causes some people to be, it, it could be the same gene, it could be another gene that's triggering that. Um, but, you know, th there's a lot that, that we don't know. Um, what One thing, you, you, you had asked um, what treatments. Um, I have found that there are a lot of doctors who have tried a lot of things and a lot of people, and we, we don't know what works. We do know that sleep is one of the biggest issues for EDS patients. We do know that when patients don't sleep, yep. they have dramatically more pain, more autonomic dysfunction, more symptoms. Cognitive issues. Yeah. And there's a doctor, Dr. Pasinki has um, lectured about helping, pa they, they have noticed that patients with Ehlers Danlos and autonomic dysfunction have spikes of adrenaline at night, and those can kick them out of deep sleep cycles. So sometimes something as easy as taking um, some sort of medicine to block adrenaline, like a beta blocker at night, can drastically improve a patient's pain the next day. We, we, we see that patients that go on sometimes a mast cell diet where they don't have as many inflammatory um, foods going into their body can reduce their inflammation and reduce their pain. There's a lot of things that, that you, we're not looking, when we look at treatment, we're not looking for something that makes it 90% better. We're looking for a bunch of little things that are 5 to 10, maybe 20% most differences that, that can help us, that can all add up. To, for each individual to make them feel better because there's really but aside from helping with sleep I, I don't think there there's anything that you can really target as a whole with us i mean sleep and pain and what about hydration hydration is a huge huge thing yeah. but it's not that simple a lot of patients um with ehlers-danlos um with dysautonomia need eight everybody to ten. just picked up their water <laughs> yeah, right do you see that we all, are... <laughs> we all it's not that far from us I know, right? you know so what? you're you're you are right in that a lot of people need hydration and not just water we just right. water just goes right through us we right. or it makes us blow up yeah um we need to add salt to that water and pots experts say we need eight to ten grams of salt a day that's huge that's 42 gatorades for eight grams of salt so a lot of us take salt pills. A lot of us um, you eat know, a lot of pickles. Eat a lot of yeah, but pickles are high histamine, so some patients can't do that either. <laughs> Again, there's nothing that really. I mean, hydration, sleep. You know, it, it, it's everybody's just so individual. Yeah, it really is. I think also what's important, like Virginia, um, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit. I know Virginia and I've talked a lot about this too. And this, of course, this is my realm of interest in research is more of the mind body practices also in you know we were talking about grounding and virginia can explain it but sometimes there's a lot of over medicalization that's happened that's caused a lot of issues and injury in us because we've tried too many things or too many medications at once or too many surgeries that people have left disabled and, and different things and 
you know, kind of scaling back and kind of thinking a little bit more simply and things like just as simple as this, I'm gonna let Virginia talk about what grounding really is, but even looking at biomechanics and different things, just simple things that really aren't that simple, but how they really react to the body and what happens when we just take ourselves in nature and go outside or, you know, just kind of do things that seem maybe not the immediate, you know, help, but, you know, or just little things here and there that help uh, lifestyle medicine, if you will. I think that's so important because a lot of times it's what we can do when we don't have somebody that helps us and even just a little bit helps us and if somebody doesn't have anybody to help them, they can do it. And it's also about self-empowerment and it's also about self-efficacy. I don't, I, if I'm on a deserted island, I want to still be able to help myself in some way. If I don't have a medication, if I don't have this, I want to be able to deep deep and figure out something. So Virginia, would you mind talking a little bit about that? There was a great study that also just came out about this that I find absolutely fascinating. And, and don't ask me all the names in that. My brain doesn't retain them. That's another EDS thing. I want to stop before I talk about that is one of my problems in getting diagnosed is my normal isn't everybody else's normal. And EDS typically runs through families. I grew up in a very large family. So all of us did what we call these party tricks. We thought everybody could do them. We thought everybody could put their finger the back. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We, we thought everybody could maneuver their bodies in these strange ways. I didn't know what I was doing was not normal. Uh, and I still struggle with that. So one of the things that is very important for me is to question my capability or my incapability of doing something. Is that normal? It, it, does the rest of society, are they capable or incapable of doing that? And if I can come to that conclusion and identify it as an EDS symptom, then there may or may not be something that I can do about it. But I truly believe that there's so much we can do for ourselves that we've all heard it. Eat right, exercise right, eat the right diet. I find that these little things that I incorporate into my life can, can be dramatic changes for me. Uh, one of the things I'm really working on currently is we are animals. Animals have a daily rhythm to themselves. And as um, Americans and, and people around the world, we have changed that rhythm. We have put ourselves in these houses. We've changed the way light affects us during the day. And I'm trying to figure out if some of my issues are because I've lost that natural rhythm. So one of the things that I do and has been hugely helpful for me is, is experts say, if you can get into natural light the first hour after you wake up, it helps establish an incredible rhythm in terms of your cortisol levels for when you sleep at night. It establishes when you're supposed to eat during the day. That 10 minutes of sunlight within that, what I call that first golden hour, has been hugely helpful for me. I, mean, I that, go outside. It also activates the, the, the um, what I, I just lost the word. But the endorphins, they're yeah, also acting exactly. immediately. So I totally so, understand that. So and I take 10 minutes in the morning and I go outside and I sit quietly and I meditate, get my a little bit of vitamin D, which we struggle with. And I don't do it in the hot heat. I do it in the morning when it's cool. I get that sunlight when it's so important for my body. And I have seen dramatic differences in my health. And you don't have to be somebody with EDS to benefit from that. I also do grounding when I do that in the morning. Uh, there is a lot of study now that we have separated ourselves from the earth and the earth sends this energy. We ground our houses, we ground our cars, but we're no longer grounding ourselves. And if you talk to folks with fibromyalgia and other issues and, and they are outside gardening in the summer, they will typically tell you it's the summer weather but now there is some belief it's the touch with Mother Earth that gives us this energy that we respond to. We disconnected ourselves from that. So I make it a point to get connected with Mother Earth every day for at least several minutes. And I try to do it in the morning when I wake up and I get that energy from Mother Earth. I also have 
surrounding items that are in my house that that like, like, like pillowcases and sheets and stuff that yeah. you actually plug into the wall because your house is grounded so you plug it into the grounding portion of your outlet and it changes that that energy within your body yeah. uh, it was a dramatic difference for me when i added that to my sleep regimen i want to encourage folks to do what the doctors have been telling you to do eat right sleep right exercise right for you my exercise is going to be different than the other folks right. on this call. it might just be in daily movement versus exercise sometimes we have to change yeah. what the patients are of ourselves and and to virginia's point there's if anybody's interested in the research i mean there is i've done so much research because of the certification i've been doing this last three years really good research, scientific research, talking about the fact of like how our human body, because we are, you know, part of nature interacts with environment, whatever you want to call it. And that taking ourselves outside of it, you know, we wild animals aren't studied in captivity, or we've learned that that's not the right way to study them. But yet we study ourselves in captivity, right? So there's just been a lot of research, really good, fascinating research that just talks about how, you know, just our interactions with the natural environment versus, you know, fake environment, if you will, how that just changes our DNA or our presentation of our illnesses or how that might be able to help us. And it seems so simple, but yet, I don't know, then some of us have issues with going outside and the heat and sunlight and all that stuff. So of right. course we have to get around it. But the point is, is that we've kind of subtracted ourselves from some of these simple things that are part of nature and science and real stuff and the way we study other animals so and that's something that we can talk about and uh, you know and another its one yeah, it's, it's massive. yeah. Sure. um you know we're going to wrap it up here um melissa <laughs> tell me some of the things that might have been helpful for you while dealing with EDA. so honestly support groups um at first they were not what i expected but Honestly, Megan, you know, I found her and I found that there was this also entire group of people that were just willing to share information and good information and encourage. And, you know, I, I ran into this community of people that was complete opposite of what I was seeing. And it was it was really what kind of helped me crawl out of my early shock and depression from diagnosis and everything. So honestly, this community. So the community, the community that you can identify with. Exactly. And, and relate with. Okay. How about you, Stephanie? Oh gosh, there's so many things. Well, I think. We'll keep it to a few. <laughs> you can give I me think a few, I wish. Like major ones. I wish people would have made it clear that it's okay to ask your doctor questions before they ask you. Like I, when I was younger, I was always afraid to ask them stuff unless they came to me with it. And until I found a doctor that like was comfortable with me coming forward with things, right. it was really different. And I think I could have been diagnosed a lot sooner if I knew that that was an option. So um, what, is, what helps you with it is what I'm saying. Like, what are what are some things that have helped you with? Oh, EDS? gosh, help me with it. Okay. Um, Your sparkly like you said, The people. Yes, my I okay. decorate everything I use. Like I have pains and crutches and everything. And like, I find ways to make it like so you fun and enjoyable. everything. So, yeah, I do. And <laughs> I have different you. ones that match different outfits. Like I have summer ones with daisies on them and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I write a lot. I write about my experiences. I write about what it's like to work with EDS. I write about, like I've interviewed my mother mm -hmm. and I've written about what it was like to raise a kid with EDS who wasn't diagnosed. Um, and so for me, it was similarly like what you said about support groups in some support groups, it becomes kind of a contest of like, who's the sickest? Yeah. And there's sort of like this drama that can be too much. But if you can weed through that, there are some really awesome people that you can connect with. And I think, like you said, it's information, which is great, but there's also just like all of these women right here who don't feel weird. You know, like right. I always, like even before I knew exactly what I had, I knew that I was different. I knew that something wasn't right. And around like this type of, group I don't feel that way right you need right. someone who makes you feel like oh it's okay it's okay if you have to cancel tomorrow because your pain is too bad and I think that's really important just like Meg and I had to cancel I was like cool we'll go next week right you good no it's just it's one of those weeks and and you know it's it's 
that's one of the hardest things for us. It's not just dealing with that, it's dealing with the social stigma. Like, oh, you know, one day we can do something and the next day we can't. And we can't yeah. explain why our bodies break one day. And one day <laughs> I can go swing dancing and the next day I cannot leave my bed. And, and sometimes I can do a lot and be fine. And sometimes I can walk my dog to the end of the curb and I cannot do anything else for three days. And it, it's hard because friends often don't understand that. And we become closer with those in the community um, because, you know, they understand what we're going through. We can, we can relate and, and they, they don't, you know, put all these social pressures on us that, you know, a lot of other people do. No, and I also think it's important, too, that you see people like Virginia or different people that are working, too, that are living. And, you know, we can all understand each other, but we also can laugh. We can, you know, be friends and talk about other things other than EDS. But we also understand if somebody has cancer, we can also see people that are professionally doing well <laughs> and found a way to get by. Like Virginia was talking about what she did after she was diagnosed. I think that's also so critical that you know, you know, part of the mission of EDS wellness is to help people restore function and live well. And it's not, people always think that it's always about diet and exercise for me, but it's not. I mean, there's, there's the seven pillars of wellness and that includes so many different things. And sometimes it's so much less about that and more about your community, what your environment is, what you're seeing in your house, or you're going outside enough, you know, things like that, it, whatever it is, it's also for me, I have to have a barrier. You know, I work and entrenched in this community, but I've learned for myself mentally, I have to have my time outside of it. My family deserves that. You know, they, I need that. I love photography. Yes, I do like to work out, but you know, my family likes to fish. I like to travel. I love to laugh. You know, I, I love all that stuff. I'm also very, I love to write, you know, there's, it's important to have those outlets and be who you are outside of that, but also right. be okay with who you are and you know, that can even be hard even within your own family. You know, my family, it can sometimes be a challenge, but thankfully I have a wonderful husband and three kids. And I also don't, we don't have labels in my house. I don't really, it, I don't really talk about, you know, mommy has EDS, you know, it really is, my EDS is more of what I do for work, but I don't, this is just how we live. This is our lifestyle, you know, versus a label, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I think it's so important just to kind of also find ways to keep going and how I do it is different than everybody else and uh, what my needs are is different. But, you know, that that what helps us is is just a portion of that is is the physical, whether it's medication or whatever else other yep. will help us or all these other things that we're talking about, too. Yeah. And speaking about portion, this is just a portion of what it is that we could talk about. You know, I mean, we could be here all to, night. We could be. Oh, we God. could be here all week. Absolutely. I, I actually wrote a Facebook post today that it's actually public on my wall so it's on the street, with a lot of the issues that Elder Stanlow's patients face, um, issues with getting medications, um, issues with the opioid crisis, issues right. with disability, um, ADA, um, you know, thing, getting physical therapy. There are a lot of issues that um, we actually really need um, healthy people to help us advocate for, you know, to cop contact congressmen to to try to you know prevent some of these laws from being you know um put into action so but also to understand the spectrum there could be days where you have people that don't use any canes or wheelchairs like me but that doesn't mean the next day that i'm not bedridden for three days and i don't you know i slept for two days or that that's true different than somebody that might use canes or something like stephanie was talking about there's such a spectrum with eds mm -hmm. and it's not that it's benign or one is more or less severe. There's also this new hypermobility spectrum disorders group that you don't fit under a certain criteria. And it's not that one is less or more severe or one is benign. I hate that word, benign. Yeah. It's all equally important and it all deserves awareness, recognition, and to be treated seriously because sometimes that, and a lot of times that awareness and recognition early prevents and can help somebody from spiraling in a permanent way. And that's and why we're doing the show here. Out. That's yes. why we're doing the show here with the Risen Strength Motivational Podcast to bring awareness to EDS. But we also have the Speaking of the Heart Radio Network, which is the podcast network, which is all about you know restoring purpose and passion to those who need it most. You can tell that people who deal with Ehlers Danlos <laughs> Syndrome definitely are in that category. They need to be heard. They need to be understood. They also need to be able to reach outside of what it is that they're ailed by which is what it is that we're definitely talking about to go along with 
because we can't just worry about what it is that the docs say. We can't just worry about what it is that CDC says. We have to find ways in order to be able to reach outside of what it is that we're ailed by, despite what it is that we're going through. Folks, I want to say thank you for being on the panel here for this evening. Yeah. Um, you know, thank you. definitely, like I said, this thank is, you. This is definitely something that can be talked about for a long, long time. And you know, like I said, we have some ideas in the, in the near future where we think that we can really get this not only EDS uh, out there as far as awareness, but also from EDS wellness, of which is some of the stuff that we were talking about this evening. Next week, we are going to be talking with Seth Rotberg. Seth Rotberg is a good friend of mine, and he is going to be bringing awareness to Huntington's disease. Uh, oh. It is something that a lot of people don't know a lot about it, and he is one that is able to talk about it in a way that I think that people can understand. So we are looking forward to having Seth on for next week's show. Next week's show is going to be at the regular time, which is Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I want to say thank you for joining us this evening. I know that we started off late. We had some, uh, let's say, technical difficulties. It was kind of hectic here it's for a little bit. Fluctuations in my own house, as we all can, we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, utilizing the risk and strength within us all. So I want to say thank you for watching, and we will talk to you again soon. Join us again for next week, and we will be talking about EDS a lot more. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.